Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you, as always, for being here. It is a bit unusual, of course, having an Arsecast on a Wednesday, but this is a strange kind of week with Christmas coming up at the weekend, so I thought it would be good to do a show today, talk about our enjoyable 5-1 win over Sunderland in the Carabao Cup last night, some uh, interesting bits and pieces to come out of that, which then gives me a couple of days of, of sort of downtime uh, heading into Christmas to to do all the bits and pieces, go to the airport to collect my daughter, do the shopping, get things ready, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because while for many, Christmas is a, a time where you've got some holidays, some time off work, there's loads of football. So uh, it doesn't stop on our blog, and we will have all the match coverage for you, reports and live blogs and player ratings and all that kind of crack. But just to get the podcast out today, I'm going to have a couple of days off. Uh, in terms of the podcast schedule over the coming days, we're going to do something on the 27th on Patreon. We'll do a sort of review preview podcast with Lewis. That'll be available for our Patreon members. And for everyone else, we're going to have an Arsecast Extra the day after the Wolves game, which is on the 28th. So that's going to be on the 29th. So we'll have an Arsecast Extra, myself and James, for you on the 29th. So that's the reason for this particular Arsecast today, which I'm going to get pretty much straight on with. Uh, I'll be back after this conversation uh, with a few final thoughts. So, without further ado, to talk to me about that 5-1 win over Sunderland, Eddie and Kedia, Flo Balagoon, Charlie Patino, and lots, lots more. Delighted to welcome to the show James Bench. Hello, festive greetings to you. Yeah, festive greetings. Merry Christmas to you. Yeah, let's not go uh, full Grinch on this because it was a good night, uh, uh, almost like a throwback to those... Carabao Cup slash Carling Cup games of the past when Arsene Wenger used to just put names in a hat, none of them above 18, and just throw them out on the pitch and tell them, go out there and just have a bit of fun, guys. And and they'd, you know, blow away lower league opposition. Not quite the same, but but similar um, and enjoyable because of that, I think. Yeah, I mean... It, it was, in a way, it's sort of that strange thing where you go, oh, there's not many kids in this starting 11 and well, the bench isn't, you know, full of academy graduates. Then you run down the list and you're like, oh, yeah, wait, there's Emil Smith-Rowe, there's Bakayo Saka on the bench, you know, Eddie Nketi is up front, Flo Balogun. And I think this is a curious thing where we've got so used to the, the them making up the sort of crux of the match day squad, um, you know, especially the likes of Smith-Rowe and Saka and that lot. But you do sort of forget that it's like, yeah. well, you know, these are the... The youngsters of the, you know, these are the best and brightest of the academy that Wenger used to roll out. And actually, you know, quite often they wouldn't be regular starters. You know, the academy graduates specifically wouldn't be regular starters under under Wenger. And maybe we all got a bit spoiled by his willingness to just chuck those youngsters in. But actually, Mikel Arteta right now, he's built the team around them. So yeah. you might argue, Charlie Patino aside, and there are some other good players, but look, the best and brightest at Hale End... They're already in the team. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think there is a, a thing right now where there is just a little bit of a gap in terms of, you know, the sack of the Smith Rowe and Keddy of those kind of guys in their age bracket and the next generation that are coming that aren't quite ready to make that step up to sort of, you know, pack the bench with these guys. So we do have that bit of a, a thing. But I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, we forget, you know, Smith Rowe a year ago. It's just coming up to a year since he was thrown in. Um, well, thrown in. I mean, it was a very deliberate decision to put him in, but but obviously it was one that was... So we thought might get him the sack. Yeah, well, you know, it was one that, that came out of a, a, a situation in which there was a great deal of adversity in that you had to do something different. You had to try something and, look, he tried it and it worked and here we are 12 months down the line, everyone's raving about Emil Smith-Rowe. But uh, yeah, I mean, he had to start a few of those guys um, because of COVID, because of a few absences, etc., etc. But I suppose we should talk about two players in particular and maybe the nights that they had, the contrasting nights that they had, tell us a little bit about uh, both of those players. Flo Balagoon is a, a, a very highly rated young man that lots of people are interested in and want to see and want to see get playing time and get chances. But I think when we when we see him at this level, it becomes really clear that a lone move to play regular football against grown-ups against men is really, really important for him. I don't think he was necessarily bad last night, but 
the few times we have seen him at this level, there's been a bit of a struggle for him to impose himself and to and to show his talent. Maybe he was trying a bit too hard last night at times as well. But it really is important that that what happens in January, uh, which could be complicated, of course, by the Aubameyang situation and other things as well. But but we've got to get this young man some regular playing time somewhere. Oh yeah, absolutely. I just, I think the real thing, you know, when you're saying he struggles to impose himself, I think maybe the challenge as well he has is from watching those clips, and I've only really seen clips of him this season mm. at under twenty three level. Is actually that's what he does. He bullies these, you know, eighteen year old, nineteen year old centre backs. It's very easy for him. And well, if you go and play against the Sunderland, you know, a League One defence, the one thing you're not going to be able to do. Even if you're uh, experienced, uh, you know, even if you're a youngster that's experienced at, at Premier League level, is you're probably not going to be able to physically impose yourself on them. And I thought the uh, the Sunderland defence, actually, I mean, you know, say now, I thought Sunderland were pretty excellent for for a League One team. And despite the scoreline, I thought they gave Arsenal some some difficult moments. And I can say that because Arsenal won quite comfortably. Yeah. Um, I, it, it, without that. It was sort of as though he's obviously not had experience of what else you do against defenders. You know, a lot of under-23 football, and it's long since past the stage where it, it is of any real value for him. I, I, I sympathise with Arsenal not taking that decision to loan him out uh, in the uh, in the summer window because there was so much confusion, you know, a lot of injuries and COVID, and it was fair to question whether, uh, you know, Aubameyang and Lacazette, I think they'd missed pretty much every game almost before September, were really struggling for fitness. So you didn't know if you might mm. need Balogun again. And, and as you say, that's a question that, that maybe hangs over January. Equally, I think it's pretty clear now that, that maybe you've got to be willing to accept that, you know, take the risk that you might be a striker. You might have to play someone else at striker because I just don't, I don't see the occasion where Balogun is the one you'd want to pick. That's not a criticism of him. It's just where he's at. You know, once he's played six months at, at League One or Championship level, I think you'd have a lot more confidence thrusting him into the spotlight. I think we saw against Brentford and we, we saw tonight in that you know, difficult position for him at wide on the left. He just needs those, he just, as you say, he just needs repetitions, mm. experience against defenders that are going to try and bully him. And you know, how do you get out of that? What other qualities have you got? You know, How do you use your pace to really challenge these defenders that, that might not have that, but can out-muscle you? So yeah, it was, a, it was disappointing. And you could feel him snatching at chances as well. I think he like so many young debutants he just wants that goal but uh yeah i, I think alone and we'll see how he we'll really see how good he is because i don't really feel like i know yeah well that's yeah that's true and look he has scored a couple of goals for us in the europa league but uh, at this level um the experience you have and the way that you know you might never be able to out muscle or dominate central defenders you're probably not going to be able to do that but what you can do is learn how to escape their evil clutches if you're a forward you know and 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 getting kicked around and getting bashed around a bit by big guys um you know will teach you plenty in a, in a short space of time in comparison we could see that Eddie Nketiah is more ready uh, he has much more first team experience uh, for Arsenal. He had a loan spell at Leeds, which didn't go brilliantly, but it was certainly something that that benefited him. He looks like a player who physically now is is much more capable at this level, and his performance and his movement and his his uncanny ability to be in the right place at the right time in the box, whether it's getting on the end of something or being in kind of the right area when something just drops, you know, the, the, the brilliant Orbino stats. Uh, and I enjoyed your meme <laughs> last night. The Simpsons meme last night was really good, but you know, he, he, he is a penalty box poacher. That's what he is. He is a guy who scores goals inside the penalty box and he looks like a much more uh, developed player. He's a couple of years older. Of course, we have to point that out too. Oh. Uh, but, but those two guys, I think people put them in similar-ish brackets and you could just see the difference last night. Oh, and and I think it does, a lot of it does fall down to, you know, some of the things you were saying there about knowledge of the game and, you know, an ability to, to make decisions. What really stood out to me, watching the replay of his first goal, you, you can see him following Rob Holt and he's, you know, fixed on where the ball is flying off. And the minute it hits Holding's head, he knows where it's going mm. And therefore, I, I would assume, I, I can't, you know, claim I know, but he's, he's in his head, he's calculated, okay, this is where, 
you know, this is where if the keeper saves it, it's probably going to drop about here. And guess what? There he is before any centre back. Um, you know, it kind of reminded me of um, in the in the last dance, the the series about the Chicago Bulls, where Dennis Rodman is talking about rebounds and you know, the ball spinning this way. And I I feel like you see that with Enketia because it's it's not something that just happens. It's not something that you're just gifted with. You can really tell that he works day in, day out at making mm. sure well. You know, the best thing I can do, my my best qualities are my ability to my ability to pounce around the area. I think it's worth saying that we saw against Everton, he can do a little bit more. You know, I think he's been quite good when he's been brought on for 15, 20 minutes in, in wide areas. I still wonder if, you know, it might be better playing your 72 million pound winger those 15 or so minutes. Mm. But he's he's doing a lot and I think he's he's added things. Yeah. I, I think he, he, he has a bit of a burst. He's willing to run at defenders, but still, you know, it is if you're doing the football manager attributes, his sort of anticipation or however you want to call it, it's sky high. And, um, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about his future. For me, it's the thing where I, I can always see a role for Eddie and Ketty at Arsenal. I just don't know if it's going to be the role he wants. Well, that's it. That's it. And I think you're right to say that he... He has developed, certainly in preseason, he looked very bright. And I, I do think that there's something about him now physically. Um, you know, before he was quite slight, and I think he now is a bit more physically mature and also understands the game and understands the movement of, of defenders. Before we talk about his future, I think we should, uh, if we're talking about his anticipation, it's not just about where the ball is going to drop when the keeper makes a save, but the movement across the defender for the second goal is fantastic. And he knows he just has to make a slight contact uh, with it to to stick it in the net. Similarly, the, the execution of that finish for the third goal is one of those, it's kind of like a showboaty five-a-side goal. You know, when someone scores out in five-a-side, you, know, you want to clatter them. But uh, it is a great finish. It really is. And again, he's on the move. Not the first time we've seen that from him this season. He scored a very similar goal against AFC Wimbledon in a previous round of, of the Carabao Cup. So this is definitely something he's got in his locker. So if the first one looks a little bit... I don't want to say clumsy. He just basically used his thigh to put the ball in the back of the net. The The second two, the other two finishes are just really, really good. Um, you know, as a striker, as a poacher, as a penalty box goal grabber, you can't ask for more. I, I agree with every word. I thought with that third goal, I mean, I know what you mean. It's very showboaty. And yet, you know, when when you see the replays, I think it's Flanagan is right on his back. You know, it's mm. very much kind of blocking off the the flick around the corner in it, first time with the right foot. And probably if Nketiah had taken a touch, you know, he might have been able to wriggle out of it, turn around, get mm. shot away. But it would have become a much more difficult chance. Um, I think in many ways, obviously no one sees it coming and that's what makes it the, the most effective shot. But really it's about having the vision and the understanding of where the defenders are and where they're going to be that allows him to get away this really high percentage shot if he hits it correctly. I mean, the other example, the the the, the second goal, Pepe's goal, is I think you see a really excellent run from him to the near post as a, as a decoy. I mean, mm. he may well have got the ball other occasions, but it just drags the defence and suddenly what opens up for Pepe is that space for a shot. Yeah, I mean, around the... It, What's interesting with Nketiah is these are sort of feel like old man penalty box traits, don't they? The sort of things you would expect from a from a thirty two year old veteran, like a you know an aging striker who's maybe lost a yard of pace, but he knows how to manoeuvre defences, like a Cavani. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really like that about him. He's, he's so so smart around the penalty, and someone that you know whether it's you see it yourself on a replay or the the commentators call it out. There's always something interesting he's doing in the penalty box that maximises. Arsenal's chances of scoring a goal. I like that a lot. So his future is a really interesting discussion. Mikel Arteta um, has spoken and always spoken pretty highly of Eddie um, about how he wants him to stay. I'm just getting some quotes up here um, when he talked about, uh, let me just grab them here. 
I did have them right open, but of course I can't find... Uh, okay, okay, he says, I tell you every day we want to keep Eddie. We see how he trains. That's what he does every day. He works so hard, puts the ball in the net every session, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then he talked about, a, you know, was asked about a new contract. He said, we're trying. It's not about anything else but minutes. He wants game time. He wants to be on the field. And that is the only reason to say, can I do it here? That's the question. We all want him to stay. And I can, I can sort of... I understand that because I see a young striker with some attributes that we don't necessarily have in in uh, in the squad in great depth. Certainly, uh, as long as Aubameyang is is on the naughty step or in Siberia or whatever you want to call it, um, he's at a, a good age. You want to have a, a deep squad. You want to have different qualities in the players that you have. So a penalty box striker, somebody who can tuck away those half chances or quarter chances or anticipate something like it feels like so many of his goals just come almost out of nothing in a way. Um, but at the same time, Eddie's going to be 23 in May. So when his contract runs out, he's 23. Paul Merson was talking about him last night on Sky and was quite good, but but seemed to think he was 20, which gave him a bit more time perhaps to mm. to find a role for himself at Arsenal. But he's not. He's going to be 23. He wants regular playing time. And nobody can begrudge him or any other player that. At the same time, you can see with Aubameyang, Lacazette, their Arsenal careers coming towards an end, that there might be a pathway. But the conventional wisdom is that Arsenal are going to go and buy a forward. They're going to go and buy a striker uh, in the market. Somebody who, with all due respect to Eddie, is probably a bit more of an all-round forward, a bit more of a, you know, somebody who can bring players, uh, link players from deep and also provide that penalty box threat uh, to do a bit more of, let's say, what Lacazette has done in the last couple of games, tallied with more uh, frequent goal scoring, of course. So if you're Eddie, you're looking at this going, well, I'm going to be 23. They're going to bring in a, a, a high-profile striker, so I'm going to be second choice. I've got a Bosman. It's a brilliant opportunity to to get offers, isn't it? Like he won't have a better time in his career to look at the many offers that will come his way because he's going to be essentially a tree, uh, free transfer. Um, mm. There'll be a tribunal fee if he stays in England, but he could go to any club in Europe for nothing. So if you're Eddie and Arsenal are offering, offering you a new contract, as much as you might want to stay... And he might because he's been here for a good few years and he's a he's an Arsenal boy and an Arsenal fan. If you're thinking about your career, it would take a lot of convincing, I think, for for Arsenal to uh, persuade you to stay when if regular playing time is what you want, there are going to be better options, albeit perhaps at a club with, without maybe the same profile. Yeah, and I feel, uh, the only thing I would say is the challenge that Eddie's going to have wherever he goes is I do think a player like him will be viewed by most managers as someone that they would rather have on their bench than in their starting eleven. Now, obviously, you know, the lower down the football pyramid or the lower down the, the Premier League he looks, mm. the more he might find a manager who, you know, says, okay, he's still the best goal scorer I have in the squad. But, uh, you know, I don't, I, you know, if I look at some of the teams that I know have had a look at him in the past, West Ham, he's not going to overhaul Mikel Antonio. Um, and I know that's quite quite an extreme example because Antonio is a really good striker. I mean, even Brighton, though, you would say he is competing with a with a Mope for minutes. That's the the only thing I would would say, and it, is that I do think that just because he's he's so based around finishing, putting the ball in the net and maybe isn't a do-it-all striker. I wonder if a lot of other teams also want, they also want a, mm. a Jonathan David and Alex Lacazette that scores goals, however you describe it, and that they would kind of go, oh, well, yes, we'd really like Eddie and we'll pay him a lot of wages because we're not we're not going to uh, you know pay a big transfer fee for him. But I think it's going to be a tough decision for Eddie to find that right club that will play him 38 games a season. Um, mm. he, there are certainly going to be some out there, but I, I wonder how willing he is to kind of 
step down to the lower reaches of the Premier League where it gets tough for strikers, where, you know, you can go five, six games without a goal and the fans are on your back and, you know, the manager's saying, we need you to score 20 goals to keep us in the Premier League. That yeah. could be tough. And maybe do, do, maybe the best thing for him is to be Arsenal's closer. Do you get that service at that level of the Premier League as well? Do you get the the chances that you need when you're that penalty box striker? I mean... <laughs> There's a couple of things that occur to me. One is obviously how the rest of this season pans out for Arsenal may have an impact where if there's European football next season of some description, then it becomes perhaps a little more attractive for him to stay because he might say, well, look, I'm going to get League Cup games. I'm going to get European games. I'm going to get, um, you know, FA Cup games. Uh, I'll get some minutes in the Premier League. If Aubameyang and Lacazette are gone and I'm second choice, then there's going to be minutes. If there's injury suspensions, you know, I could play plenty at Arsenal. The other, the other thing, and I don't mean this in any way to be, uh, to do him a disservice, but you see a night like last night where he's really, really good and he scored excellent goals and there was so much about his game and about his play that was admirable and enjoyable, but it was also against League One opposition. <laughs> yeah, You know, there is that consideration uh, as well where that level of performance, I think, is going to be much more difficult to replicate in the Premier League. You know, with the greatest of respect, I, I don't think... If you're playing against a Rafael Varane, for example, you're going to be able to shoot across him and score that second goal because, you know, he's too good for that kind of thing. And I think in general, the the level of defending in the Premier League, even if there are um, some cluggers in, in comparison with some of the best defenders, it's it's a cut above League One by some distance. So can he or does Mikel Arteta believe that he has the ability to do it at Premier League level? He seems to think so. I mean, I guess when he talks about wanting him to stay, he must think he can, but but can he? That's that's the question. Yeah, I mean, the Arsenal may well want him to stay as as you say, as that number, you know, we, we all sort of believe that uh, and know that, that Arsenal are looking for that number one striker mm. and that, you know, Nketiah, Nketiah feels like a player for uh, Premier League level, a player for when the game is stretched, when, you know, that you you have a degree of desperation when the opponents are clinging on for a point or for three points and you just need that extra body in the box you know he that seems perfectly suited to him at a team like Arsenal um it's not a bad role to have uh you know it's a role that you could even see you know if Gareth Southgate says oh he does that well for Arsenal why couldn't he do that well for for England but it's that is the challenge. And I think the way that he gets to the level where he can beat Raphael Varane or Virgil van Dijk at the near post is playing 38 Premier League games for three years straight. Or, mm. you know, 30 Premier League games for three years straight. And, you know, whatever competition Arsenal are in, that's not coming. And we, we've seen him have good moments in the Premier League. I think he's shown enough in that competition that if I were signing him for nothing, I'd be super inclined to give it a fly. You know, I remember an excellent game against Everton. Um, there have been other flashes, but a top team competing for Europe, they don't have the, they don't have the chance and the time to develop him mm. at Premier League level. And maybe, you know, the, the real challenge here might be that if Arsenal can't say to him, you know, sign a new contract, and I'd be saying, you know, let's let's agree something that gives both parties flexibility. You know, what about if you sign for two years, Eddie? Mm. You know, you can then go next summer. You're in a great position, but we can still get a bit of a fee for you. Because what you really want is you want to know, is Eddie going to be any good? Is he, could he be a sort of player that you want back? Like Chelsea did with Romelu Lukaku. Now, I don't think Nketi is going to be of a Lukaku level, but I don't, I don't know what he could be. Um, it's going to be tough when, you, you know, if he's out of contract, you've got yeah. no ability to put in a buyback clause to guarantee yourself, you know, 10% of whatever he goes on to be. But yeah, it's tough. I think... I think there's a lot of an argument for just trying to get him tied up for just a two-year deal that gives flexibility to both parties. But I, I think Eddie is rightly concerned about right now and let me play this se next season, let yeah. me play 35 games. Well, I mean, it, if you think about someone like Tammy Abraham at Chelsea who, you know, is a homegrown striker but went on loan and scored a load of goals on loan and scored plenty of goals for Chelsea as well. But at the top level of the Premier League, they said, 
it's not what we want. It's not good enough. Um, I don't really see Eddie as being in the same league, certainly in terms of how many goals he scored at the top level or, or consistently throughout his career. So it is... It's an interesting one, and I do wonder if maybe the Aubameyang situation and the Lacazette situation might play a part in, in what Arsenal are thinking, because if those guys go and Eddie goes and Balogun's out on loan and maybe isn't quite ready, maybe needs another season on loan, then you're looking at buying two strikers. So I, I'm wondering, is there a cost issue here for Arsenal when yeah. they talk about this and when they think about this, which is, you know, again, completely understandable. Let's move on and let's just talk very quickly about a couple of other players who, who stood out last night. For about the first 20 minutes, I looked at Nicolas Pepe and went, my goodness, I can see why he hasn't been playing. And then it just sort of clicked for him. I'm not saying the goal is exactly what did it, but but certainly he really grew into that game. He scored the goal, uh, a couple of assists. He was not making the shite out of the Sunderland players at will. Um, a really interesting performance considering he hasn't played for about six weeks. Yeah, I mean, we do have to put the same caveat we put on yeah. Nketiah's performance that we did on Pepe's. And, yeah. you know, I think there were a lot of people that, that could have written some quite... Uh, yeah, it, it, it's hard to... It's hard to sort of really know which Pep. The, that's the challenge. Even in that Sunderland game, even when he was on form, there were moments of real wastefulness. And I think, you know, we all have to sort of understand that the best wide forwards, the best creators, they do lose the ball a lot. Go and look at Sadio Mane at, um, at Liverpool. He's, you know, he's a walking, give the ball back to the opposition player, but actually he, you know, he scores or assists at least pretty much once a game. Pe the thing with Pepe is it's, it's too far in the direction of running into, running into dead lanes, losing the ball, giving it away. I mean, I was looking at some of his stats and, when you get him in a position where he can make the final contribution, he is still pretty much a player you could justify Arsenal's transfer fee for. He, you know, he averages, I think, his, his XA and XG are, are incredibly high per 90. Now, obviously, he doesn't play a lot of 90s. That That's part of the reason for it. But the challenge is it's so difficult for him before he gets there, his passing is pretty wayward. I think we've seen some bad crosses. He can fire a ball in, but I've also seen him fire an awful lot of balls straight out of play. He, for a dribble heavy player, a lot of them go astray, just too much. It, and that has been the story for three years. And you could still see flashes of that against Sunderland. I don't know how much of that all really comes down to. He's so rarely had consistency and that when he did, in you know last season under Mikel Arteta, he was good. He wasn't seventy-two million pounds good, but he was a good player that you could see, you know, making a positive impact for a team around fifth, sixth in the league. Equally, you know, I look at Bukayo Saka and think he's not quite as devastating in front of goal as Pepe, but like he's got everything else and he gets Arsenal. You know, you almost want everything Bukayo Saka does up until that final moment, and then. Give it, let him transform into Pepe's Nicolas finishing. Pepe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. But, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a tough one. It, well, look, I think we can read plenty into how much Nicolas Pepe has been used this season and not been used. And I think that tells us, well, A, that Bakayo Saka has that place nailed down. And B, the, the uncertainty that I think we all think Mikel Arteta has about him is, is, is obvious. That this isn't um, this isn't something that's going away, um, whether it ever will or whether the solution is um, a parting of the ways. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Obviously, he's off to Afcon now later this month, but uh, nice to see him make a contribution. And if it gives him a bit of confidence when he might be needed over the the busy festive period, then good. We should talk about uh, the hero of the hour, of course, a man whose name rang around the Emirates like he. He's some kind of hero who's been doing it week after week after week. Charlie Patino, <laughs> a really, <laughs> it's quite surreal, wasn't it, to hear his name being sung with such gusto. Like there's, we we do love the 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 young player coming through the academy at Arsenal. There's no two ways about it. Fans absolutely love 
the possibility and the potential and the future that these young players might bring to us. But but this felt like something else, you know, to have his name being sung like that. <laughs> I was going to say, you know how I think we've talked about in the past, like the the people that are guaranteed the best uh, atmosphere now whenever they met, whenever they play are the, the new signings. Mm. Everyone for like three months, it's they can do no wrong. Well, apparently, except the academy graduate, yeah, who already has a chant named after him. I mean, God, these kid, these people at the crowd must have spent a lot of time on Twitter looking up all his clips and everything. Yeah. I, I remember when, you know, going back to those old League Cup games, it was like, you know, who? Who are you? Yeah, <laughs> Coming yeah. off the bench. There was a, yeah, I mean, look, uh, that is down to the media landscape to an extent as well, because we know so much about these players coming through and everything uh, at youth level now is is pretty much televised. So we get the clips, we get the memes, we get the gifts, we get the goals, we get all of it. But but what a great moment for him to come on, make your debut, wearing the prestigious number 87 shirt for Arsenal, worn with such distinction in the past by... Uh, yeah, I can't remember anyone who's ever worn that number, but nope. nope. Uh, but like a lovely goal because when he slid in, what I like about this goal is when he slid in, I thought he was going to use his right foot, but then he mm-hmm. used his left foot in the end to poke it in. And uh, I like that. It was, it was balletic almost. It was a proper combination of like, I've got the technical excellence to score this goal, but also like, this is my debut for Arsenal. You are not taking this away from me. I'm not letting this run to anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. An amazing, amazing moment. You know, I have to say, I, I kind of quite deliberately have tried to avoid learning too much about this, this kid, because I do think I'm really of the view and I've certainly contributed to this in the past that, you know, in, in the Arsenal media landscape as well, because we all know, we all know what Arsenal fans read about more so than City fans or United fans mm. or, you know, fans of clubs that know that really most of the time their kids don't get a chance. That in the Arsenal media landscape, you know, players can be built up to demigod status before we've even really seen them do much. Um, but I liked what I saw. Little flashes, five, you know, four, one up against league one. It's not going to tell you much, but, uh, Smart kid, looked very Arsenal. Um, and when I, having said that I liked what I saw, you know, when I went and looked up his birthday and realised he was born partway through the Invincibles run, I was like, no, no, he needs to wait about 15 years before he can make his debut, surely. He's the most 12-year-old looking 18-year-old I've ever seen in my life. Like, he's not, the- he's not getting served in an off-license. If he just walks into an off-license, the, the man behind the counter is going to go, listen, you, get back to school and, you know, don't even try and come up here with your, your flagon of Linden Village. Get away from me. <laughs> Have you seen the pictures from when he signed as an 11-year-old? Yeah, yeah. He's got, like, the, this long flowing hair and looks about five years older than he does now. We might have signed <laughs> Benjamin Button. <laughs> he's taking a while to grow into himself. But, look, a, a, brilliant, a brilliant moment for him. And I think... Mikel Arteta was very pleased for him afterwards, said it was a lovely moment and and uh, was also circumspect about when we might see him again. Uh, I think the phrase he used is, we have to cook him slowly. Um, mm. You know, slow-cooked meals are delicious. Uh, and we've seen perhaps evidence of that in the, in the last few weeks with Gabriel Martinelli, who perhaps might well have been roasting over a spit for the last six to nine months, just getting him perfectly tender for Premier League football. Oh, he's good, <laughs> Medium rare Martinelli is it's what we're true. getting. It, it really is good. So, look, very, very nice uh, for Charlie Patino. There is a suggestion that the semi-final um, might take place over one leg rather than two, given the current landscape of football and COVID and restrictions and whatever might happen in the next few weeks. I mean, I think two leg semifinals in the in the season's least important competition are a bit anachronistic anyway. Um, it would be good, I think, if when we got to January and when the draw is made that common sense would prevail a little bit. There's a lot of pressure on these players. The schedule is is pretty grueling over the Christmas period. Arsenal, of course, are going to be without, well, we're already without Aubameyang, but we'll be without Pepe, we'll be without Elneny, we'll be without Thomas Partey. They're all going to the AFCON in January. So 
a two-legged semi-final, whoever it's against, was going to be uh, extremely challenging, not just from a footballing point of view, but physically as you try and maintain a level of health and, and what have you in the squad. So uh, I guess you'd be on board if it was a one leg as well. Yeah, although it does feel like the most sort of meaningless bone to throw at footballers when yeah. they've been, you know, asked to do so much and that, you know, the... the the workload on them is so intense to sort of go, well, for a few dozen of you, we're going to meet, make you only play one semi-final of this fringe tournament. <laughs> it, is, um, it doesn't really feel like we're solving the issue there. But uh, yes, I, I would absolutely say one semi-final, especially if you draw Liverpool or Chelsea or any team that have a better chance of beating you over two legs. Yeah. Well, look, there is the the possibility or or the the yeah, it's it's a horrendous one, but three North London derbies inside 12 days or 16 days whatever it might be. Uh, an unpleasant thought uh, at the best of times. So, uh, let's hope oh. we can avoid that and then come on West Ham um tonight in in the other in the other quarterfinals. Um I just want to finish with a couple of things. One Arsenal sitting in the top 4 going into this festive um, period. There is a big, big game looming, of course, on New Year's Day um, when Arsenal take on Manchester City, who who look in kind of fearsome form just at this moment in time. But you would have to say that given recent form and given some of the performances, given some of the questions that, that, that we've uh, answered in recent games, that Norwich and Wolves look pretty winnable uh, considering uh, considering what we've done of late, yeah, and I, I think Arsenal have really developed something of a, a a welcome habit of winning these games, playing ugly, playing badly, but but that they could almost and you know I, I've spent a lot of time trying to work out how do Arsenal finish fourth this season, which mm. I think it's no one thought would happen at the start of the season. We need to keep remembering that, but it it feels a bit like the, the sort of holy grail that that may be within reach, um, and it is it's by beating up on the little teams. You know, I think we see that that West Ham, Manchester United, Tottenham, they all look like teams that may well take more points off the top three, but that feel like a bit more liable and have shown they're a bit more liable to slip up against Norwich, against Wolves. Mm. You know, it is there are, I think there are an awful lot of ways in which this season is breaking a little bit favourably for Arsenal. And I think if they can just keep keep that keep that going, keep that momentum of not throwing away the silly points, which have cost them, you know, dearly in past seasons, it, it would be a, a really encouraging way to just put a little bit of, you know, uh, scoreboard pressure. Mm. Yes, Spurs and United are going to have games in hand, but they're going to probably be playing them in March and April when they could also be playing in, in multiple other competitions. I think right now is the moment where an Arsenal squad, that, as you say, it's not completely full, but it's maybe not being racked by COVID like others are. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, Arteta is able to to name a good solid eleven week in week out. This is such a valuable time to to just rack up as many points as you can. And mm. you know, I think we all will be going into New Year's Day. We'll certainly come. I think we all expect to come out of it with an even greater hangover after we've seen Man City against Arsenal. Um, so yeah, get six points beforehand and and almost you know, I don't think any you you want to win every game, but. It, it would, I think you know where Arsenal are gonna. It, yeah, it would be forth. like a, a bit of a, a bit of a crash helmet, if you like, for the Man City game. If we were to take six points from Norwich and Wolves, which would put us in a good position. Um, yeah, it might soften the blow of of Manchester City. And look, that that sense of inevitability about facing Manchester City is is not something I'm hugely comfortable with. You yeah. know, because I, I want Arsenal to be competitive against. Um, the best teams. I'm also realistic to know that there is a, a a gap and a gulf in quality there. So we'll wait and see what happens there. Final question, James. It was Mikel Arteta's second anniversary uh, this week. He was appointed uh, just over two years ago now. First came in as head coach. He's now the manager. It's been a bit mental, all of it, really. <laughs> um, on the pitch, off the pitch, in the world itself that we live in and, and everything else. But do you? how do you view it? I mean, do you get a sense that, that what we're seeing now is 
the kind of Arsenal Mikel Arteta might have envisaged when he came in? Or is this something we've stumbled into and it's nice and we like it, you know, because we're we're a bit more consistent? But it does feel like having gone through some periods of real firefighting, perhaps perhaps we've just put those flames out and, and we can now concentrate on 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 making progress and being a bit more consistent, which I think has been the big issue. Yeah, in footballing terms, in terms of what happens on the pitch, I still feel like there's a lot we don't know. Remarkable after two years, but I think it has been, uh, there have been an awful lot of sort of false dawns, muddled experiments. And do I think this is maybe still some way short of how Arteta wants to play football? Yeah, I, th- I think it probably is. I think it, it, it still feels like the squad that he wants isn't isn't quite there yet, despite the huge amount of money that has been spent. And a lot of it has been spent very well on players that will will aid in the future. And, and steps have been taken towards that. I think, you, you know, Arsenal, when he took over, were in quite, quite like, felt like they were in quite steep decline. And the truth is, it was possibly beyond Arteta to, to, to end that quicker than we thought, or as quickly as he hoped and we all expected might happen. But, you know, the, the, the things that impress me or the things that are really notable is how I think there has been a, a real sense of a change of, of culture. And I know these words are really nebulous. And if I was on the Arsenal Vision podcast, Elliot would be fuming at me even talking about culture and, and soft factors. But it is, you know, there is a, a different atmosphere. There is a, a sense in which the players don't quite rule the roost anymore and I think that's healthy for Arsenal you know this isn't just on Unai Emery as well take it back to the the days where Arsene Wenger could be a tad indulgent over players mm. I, I think those days are gone and that you have players as Arteta says when he talks about Aubameyang you know there are you are expected to come in and, and give your all every day I, I don't think anyone wants to listen to more chat about the Aubameyang situation but it, I think there is this there are now some quite solid underlying structure structures and principles around this club that Arsenal will be better for having had Mikel Arteta as the manager. I don't think it's kind of been up to the standards that everyone is entitled to expect. I do think that if, you know, if it's a sixth place finish at the end of the season, I think Mikel Arteta should be having to convince the Arsenal board why he deserves a new contract rather than the other way around. Um, But right now, and you know, both at the immediate moment. And if you try and take a bit of a step back, I feel like steps have been made and Arsenal are at least having probably bottomed out under Arteta or at least on the upswing. And and that's encouraging, even if there is a, as you said, in relation to Man City, an extremely, extremely long way to go to get Arsenal back to, you know, competing for titles as we all expect they should be. Yeah. I mean, that was never going to be a quick fix. It was never going to be a quick fix. You know, uh, the, the issue, of course, is that as football fans, we live... In the moment, we we feel what we feel because of the last game or the last performance, and you know it is sometimes hard to separate uh, the realistic side of of your brain from the side that doesn't like what you've just seen in a in a game of football. But look, here we are, fingers crossed, we can maintain this progress, and um, you know to be where we are right now at, at this point of the season is somewhat unexpected to me, but I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, I prefer it to where we were. I prefer it to the alternative, and I hope we can keep it up. Right. We're going to leave it there, James. Thank you very much, as always. A very Merry Christmas to you and yours, and Happy New Year. My pleasure. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you and uh, to everyone listening out there as well. Uh, always, a, always a joy to be on here. Thank you very much indeed to James. You can find him on Twitter at James Benj, at James Benj, and he does football stuff for CBS Sports. Right, before we go, just want to take a moment to wish you all a very, very happy Christmas, whatever you're doing with family or friends. I hope you can do as as much as possible. I hope you can do it safely. Uh, Obviously, these are weird times. Um, I think people's lives and movements and what have you are going to be restricted. So if you can't be with the ones that you love uh, at this time of the year, I'm very sorry about that. And hopefully you can stay in touch some other way. Those of you that are together, enjoy it, make the most of it. 
it's been a a weird year on a personal level in in many ways, and this Christmas is going to be very different uh, for us. And it makes you realize that the Christmases that you do have together should be uh, enjoyed and remembered and make the most of them and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, stay well, stay healthy, uh, stay together if you can. Those of you out there who don't celebrate Christmas, I wish you the very same. I wish you lots of peace and happiness and love. And to all of you over this past 12 months or so, nine months, 12 months, who've uh, supported everything that we do here on Arsblog, whether it's via Patreon, whether it's just emails, kind comments, even just listening and downloading the podcast every week, sharing it with friends, whatever it might be, it is hugely appreciated by me uh, and by all the team uh, here at Arsblog. Uh, we will continue to do everything that we do, um, do it to the best of our ability, but it wouldn't be anything without you guys on the other end of it. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you once again. Look after yourselves. Talk to you soon. Have a very merry Festivus. Whatever it is that you're going to do over the coming days, do it well. Uh, and I'll catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye. Welcome back to Holy God FM, and that's Chris Rea driving home for Christmas, which of course is the environmentally friendly way to do it, rather than use jet fuel and pollute the environment, especially if you've got one of those old Prius or a, a Nissan Leaf or one of them. Of course, you could cycle, your carbon footprint would be a lot lower, but I'd say at this point in his life, Chris is not doing an awful lot of cycling. Now we have a letter from one of our listeners. He says, Dear Holy God FM, I hope you can help me at this festive time of the year. My name is Harry and I'm having a very difficult time. It seems that because of my approach to certain matters, people want to criticise me and put me down. Just because I like going around putting my studs in the shins of other people at high speed, potentially causing serious injury, they feel I should be punished and censured. And it makes me sad. So if you had some advice for me, I'd very much appreciate it. Well, Harry, it's very simple. As the Lord said in the book of Dennis, chapter 3, Tottenham Nil, you're a filthy fucking animal and you'll burn in hell for all your sins. Now, getting back to the music and to put us back in the festive spirit, here's David Bowie and Bing Crosby from the archives singing about the worst possible thing at Christmas. The little drummer boy. Why would you get him a fucking drum kit and not an Xbox? So other people have to live in this house too, you know. Merry Christmas. Come, they told me. Burr, bum, 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 bum.